I hit go live. I'm going to turn off my camera. All right. And. Might as well just share it right now. Okay. So now. Um, but, all right. We got this going. So um, welcome uh, to uh, <laughs> Showing Trajectory. This is a um, awesome, awesome day. We are uh, joined with uh, Faye Hadley. You want to say hi, Faye? Hi. <laughs> hey, everyone. And with Larry Chin. Hi. And uh, we've got uh, uh, Jenna, <laughs> Jenna Lee uh, Feng, who is an undergraduate freshman here at Texas A&M. You want to say hi? Hi. And... Um, let me make sure that I have us all pinned properly. Spotlight for everyone. Oh, wait, hold on. Spotlighting is only one move. Oh, no, no. Okay, we want everybody pinned. Okay. So um, we are super excited to have uh, you all here today. And um, Jenna and I and uh, Anthony worked on some questions. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, let me introduce uh, Larry Chen is a world-renowned photographer in the automotive uh, media scape. And um, Faye is a uh, world-renowned mechanic now, female mechanic, mechanic, like just <laughs> awesome person uh, with a lot of enthusiasm for not just uh, being a mechanic, but for like advocating on multiple fronts in the, um, in the automotive world for females, for um, just people that wanna be mechanics and enthusiasts in general and has made a really big impact from like local car fest organization in San Antonio, Texas to her all girls garage appearances on Motor Trend. And um, Larry has uh, set a spotlight on both his personal work uh, through his Instagram posts all the way to his commercial work with Toyota and Nissan. Recently, you've been posting up a lot of your Nissan work which is all full commercial work that uh, is going to be showcased by those manufacturers and has been, I say is going to be because you just shot the Nissan stuff, but like recently even uh, shot some stuff with the Corolla um, uh, GR. And so that's like a whole nother world, but um, Jenna Lee has some questions for you all about uh, some, uh, some things. Let's see what you got, Jenna. Okay. So I'm super excited. Uh, so very easy to start. Um, tell me a little bit about kind of where you come from your background and, um, how you even became interested in cars and the automotive industry. I'm starting. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, let's see. Honestly, like if you were to ask my mother, um, like when I started loving cars, she would tell you that I like came out of the womb, just loving things with wheels and going <laughs> fast. Uh, and I have no idea where that came from because no one else in my family cares about cars at all. A lot of people think that I grew up in a mechanic shop. Uh, so I love to tell them a story of like the first time when I bought my first car and I had my dad help me change a spare uh, and it fell off. So um, that's, like, that's my parents. And I actually walked my mom through popping her hood for the first time just a couple of years ago. So um, that's my background. Uh, my, my parents are both extremely smart. Um, my mom went to Smith College um, and is a freelance writer and artist and has like always just had an incredible work ethic set a really good example for me for just um, a really you know strong um, woman who just makes her own schedule and, um, and works for herself. And then my father has his PhD from MIT. Both of them were just like, you're gonna go to college, you know? Uh, Cause I got straight A's, I was a really good student. My parents were like super, super hard on me. Like, uh, it, and all of us just had really high expectations. So, um, so we all got really good grades. And then the natural trajectory was go to college. Um, even though I, I didn't really wanna go to college. You know, I, I told my parents, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a mechanic. I started out with wanting to be a Volkswagen mechanic. Um, I grew up in a really rural town in New Hampshire where you like drove over an hour to get to the grocery store sort of thing. And my dad was just like adamant that we didn't have television. He's like, TV's the devil. Like, okay. So, <laughs> um, so I, I strongly remember every single movie I ever watched as a kid. And I personified everything anyways. So when I saw Herbie the Love Bug, like the original one, 
I was like, oh my gosh, just imagining this rally race for like mechanic driver and car were like this, this team, this trifecta, like that was, oh, that was the best. So I started collecting matchbox beetles and buses at that point. And I'm like, this, this is my future. This is absolutely my future. Um, you know, my dad was like, uh, uh-huh, no daughter of mine, um, is going to work in the trades. Like that's, that's beneath you basically it was like you know the subtext of that which is like such a shame you know because I feel like because of that you know I did go to college I got my degree in psychology I was a therapist for a year I have a little rule of myself try everything for a year because you know how sometimes like you start something and you don't like it but it's kind of because you're not good at it or like you're not in the flow yet so you got to give it a year so I was a therapist for a year apparently a very good one according to my boss and was very surprised when I quit to start at this uh, local auto repair shop um, and just like sort of start my career over again. And I always think to myself, man, like I wish I had gotten started when I knew I wanted to. I wasn't allowed to do auto shop in high school. You know, I did AP chemistry instead, you know, um, just, just because that wasn't really valued um, or the, like, the value wasn't placed on the trades. Like I feel like it, it should have been, you know, how different would my life be if my guidance counselor in high school said to me, hey, Faye, hey, wow, you're great at math and science. You're a really good problem solver. You'd be perfect for the trades. But no, it's like, you should sit on your butt and read these, you know, worthless peer reviewed articles, which, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's worth to them, but not in my life anymore. (laughs) So, um, you know, it really wasn't until I got a project car, my Volkswagen rabbit, and it broke down. Um, And as a college student, I didn't really have money to repair it. I mean, the head gasket blew, it needed a full engine rebuild. It was tired. It was worn out. Uh, I didn't have money for the rebuild, but I had money for tools. So I took myself to the Sears Father's Day tool sale in 2007. What a good daughter you were, they told me. I'm like, no, these are for me. <laughs> and bought my first set of tools, and that's how I got started. So. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. That's and weird, how, right? like, so th- was your dad a professor, or did he just get a PhD? Did he work in the private sector, or like? Uh, well, he's actually, he still works um, doing chemistry stuff. He works in the health sector now, which is like super interesting. Ended up training underneath um, a doctor that I um, had a fellowship under when I was studying at Harvard and really, really fascinating guy actually taught me that um, for a lot of reasons that I never want to get into the medical in- medical field. And it's so corrupt, but that's not a conversation for here. <laughs> but, but he's still doing like some yeah. really interesting stuff um and he was an adjunct professor for a while uh, as well so wow cool <laughs> so larry <laughs> i i don't even know where to begin and it's honestly not fair that i have to follow that amazing <laughs> journey that amazing speech um wow okay i i kind of feel like uh i'm i'm the complete opposite in a lot of ways uh um you know, compared to Faye, but it's cool. I mean, we're both, you know, enthusiasts. We're both um, Supra drivers, right? We're both uh, into cars. And that that's kind of the thing that I love about car culture is it just brings so many people from so many different walks of life together. You know, it, it just, I, I always say that if uh, the world were run by car enthusiasts, it's like we could get along a lot better that way. Um, I was even just doing this shoot yesterday with Toyota where they're highlighting a, lot, a couple of people for uh, AAPI month, Asian Pacific Islander month. And you know they, they wanted to talk to me about off-roading. And one of the things that I was saying is, uh, and I've been saying for, for the past couple of years is that I'm kind of a late, bloomer when it comes to being in the off-road world and chasing off-road racing, uh, trophy trucks, all of that, that culture, you know, the sand culture. I'm, I'm late to the game, but also I'm one of the few. Like I look around when I go to these events and there's no other Asians. If the game is over a race weekend, how many Asians can you spot, you know, <laughs> aside from me? And, uh, but, but because it's about racing and it's about car culture and it's about just the passion of it, it's okay. It doesn't matter what color I am. You know, it's just super cool that they're very inclusive. And, and that's kind of, we all love cars for that reason. But in terms of being complete opposite, I was a total not straight A student. 
I barely graduated elementary school. I barely graduated middle school. And I definitely barely graduated high school. So didn't go to college. Um, I guess I guess I, I went to community college for like half a semester, dropped out because I was so bad. I guess I just, for me, it's so much about working with my hands, being out, traveling, meeting people, making friends, toying with cars, playing with cars. It started with a love for cars, a love for driving, a love for the freedom aspect of it, a love for just everything behind the wheel. It, you, you're free. You know, you're, you're just like soaring like a bird. You're just, you can go anywhere you want and with a drop of a, 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 just a, you just drop whatever you're doing at that moment. And then you can just go and you can just, you know, do what you want to do. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got into it. Um, I, I always also like to say that I quickly realized that I'm not a very fast driver, even though I love driving I just realized that I was a way better photographer than a driver. So that kind of snowballed, I guess, over time, maybe 17 years or so went by. And now I'm here taking pictures of cars every single day, day in and day out. So, um, so I want to be kind of awkward and mm -hmm. turn the table for a second and ask Jenna Lee when her moment of loving cars was, because she doesn't know I was going to ask her this. Oh, I did it. <laughs> That's not on the paper we're going off of, Joey. That's not on there. <laughs> no, it's not. But I thought it would be um, cool for you to share that. Because I don't even know. But I, it was something you had brought up. Um, so I do talk about like defining moments a lot. I think there's a lot of defining moments in your life when you realize things. And I think for me, I was never really around them growing up. Um, Larry, you're from Los Angeles, correct? Is that right? So I grew up around there and um, I've kind of been around it for a little bit. My mom is kind of into it, but um, I never really had like a, a decent like father to like instill like cars in me. So I don't know how to change a tire. I didn't know how to oil. Like I didn't know anything um, until probably recently. It's probably around high school. I kind of um, found my people and it was their thing. And they became my people and cars became my thing. <laughs> um, so it's definitely a lot later in life. Um, I honestly can't think of a, a moment where it clicked, but at some point it did. And I'm very thankful for it. Very thankful for sure. Yeah. Um, so what's weird about, uh, in a good way, <laughs> about Faze and, and Larry's stories is that uh, Larry, I'm like you. I was a horrible student. <laughs> I was a horrible student through undergrad. I graduated <laughs> with a 2.57 GPA, <laughs> and I was always told I wasn't fit for the next level of school. But I, I quote, had enough stupid in me <laughs> to like just keep going. You know? <laughs> like I just kept going to school, and somehow I talked people into letting me go build like a 500 horsepower Mercury Grand Marquis as my dissertation. And like go street, yeah, go street racing, do it all on WordPress, take photos and video of it all, and go to the Texas Mile and convince people that this was indeed a PhD project. That is insane. That is yeah. awesome. I, I don't, how come? See, I would pay attention. I feel like I would do better in school if there were teachers like you, professors like you uh, growing up. I, I just, part of it is that I feel like what was taught to me at least in school in Southern California it just didn't relate to me and it just didn't keep me interested yeah, yeah. cameras cars photography um this kind of stuff I will go out of my way and I will use all my mental capacity to understand it and to learn it and to be a part of it anytime a new technology comes out that will improve our car photography or videography or improve our media, or even just to improve our chances of getting better pictures, I want to be a part of it. You know, I want to immerse myself in it. It's, uh, yeah, I guess it's just one of those things. It just doesn't excite me with some of the regular stuff that they teach. Well, yeah, yeah and, and I feel like okay. so many teachers really miss the boat, you know, because it's like, there's so much that, um, like, math that I use now just at the machine shop is something I was talking to my mentor about the other day. And he's like, man, it, you know, if in math class, 
they teach your head like a small block Chevy, a blown small block Chevy in the corner and just be like, all right, today we're going to learn how to calculate area, you know, cubic yeah. inches. It's like, man, that could have caught my attention a heck of a lot more. And maybe I would have paid attention. I would be struggling so hard now, you know? So, and, and, you know, um, from Faye, from your perspective, like I wasn't allowed to take any of the shop courses either. Like I went to Holmes high school, which is like off 410 in Ingram and in San Antonio for those from San Antonio. Right. Um, and it was an inner city school, you know, and we had like all kinds of trades programs, but they never yeah. allowed me to take them. I never, I, like I'd want to sign up for them, but they wouldn't. But in middle school, I got to, and I took like plastics and metal and woodwork and like, you know, uh, uh, computer programming and all that stuff. And so it was this weird, like experience when I got to college where I took astronomy instrumentation, like no math required. And so we built like spectrometers where we learned how to do like machining, like, you know, machining for like astronomy instrument instruments and optics and electronics and like management of of team building for, for like putting uh, together these instruments. And I ended up just getting in this space where I had these mentors, like y'all are talking about, um, where they just made learning fun. And so I was like, that's going to be my whole goal. I don't care about getting tenure. I don't care about publishing. I just want to create a space for students to be able to know that in academia, the point is to revel in your scholarship, to revel in your passion. Like that's what we're there for because it's been so lost on tests and quizzes and rubrics totally. and like stuff that has nothing to do with what you do in the real world. And so um, hearing you all, like hearing you talk, Larry, about how, like I saw, like when you're talking about like, like you're like, Joey, like I didn't care about school, but I can tell you're saying like, but when it came to cameras and I started seeing like, okay, well, this sensor has this capability and this lens does this and this, you know, the F-stops on this one are different than, you know, this one, I didn't even know what F-stop was until this point that I had to care because I started needing to get, you know, this other thing going. And, and it's, oh, uh, were you going to say something? Yeah. Cause I, I, I'm thinking, I mean, like you just saying that um, is really inspiring. And I hope, uh, you, I mean, you're doing the work to inspire these students to get into this. And there's just so many ways to earn a good living and to be proud of your work in the automotive industry. It doesn't have to be behind the camera. It doesn't have to be in front of the camera. It could be behind the scenes. I mean, the engineering side, the marketing side, it's endless. And I mean, the people that I meet, I'm really, really bad with names. And it's really bad because I meet so many people Every time I go out to shoot, every time I go to a show, every time I go to a race, there's just so many more new people and so many friends to make that it's like a little overwhelming, you know, but it's so cool to see how many people are into this. And one of the crazy things is it's very obvious that car culture is the biggest it's ever been, period. And who knows how much more bigger it can get. I'm guessing there's still some room to grow before it starts dipping down. But right now, because of how accessible it is and how much good content, free good content is out there for uh, people to follow and enjoy and learn, it is, it's just only going to get bigger. Whereas like when I was growing up, and I'm guessing probably when Faye was growing up, it was a lot harder to get this kind of content. I mean, maybe there was a couple of mm -hmm. shows on TV there was a couple of things you can find online. Magazines were only local or on the national level. It's not like it is now when you can go on YouTube and find hundreds of shows and hundreds of car shows that are specifically targeted towards you. It's kind of insane. Yeah, I was, uh, I was talking to Jenna Lee about that because I was explaining to her like how I feel that you and, and Faye are part of this new media, social media generation of content creators where you all had that presence and then got into traditional media because of it. Whereas um, I would say like the first gen of new media that came from traditional media, like Chris Harris or someone, you know, from that era or um, even people like a little later, but early, like Rob Ferretti and, um, smoking tire, uh, uh, Matt Farah, Matt Farah, you know, 
thinking they needed to do traditional media and that was how it, they were going to make it and then ending up in new media ending up in social media really kind of showed because before there were dvds that you would literally buy at like best buy you know and they were like yeah i mean yeah. it was like it was it was very inaccessible and and so now like you said anybody with a with a little cell phone like i have here you know can go and shoot and start creating and make content that's real re, re, uh, relatable you know and the other thing i've noticed is that um like you were saying larry about like, and I, I know Faye knows this too, is just that like, there, we're so in, inclusive once we get to know each other as car people, <laughs> like, like in terms of, of, there are just so many, like you said, like you show up, <laughs> there's usually guys that are all like, well, I don't know you, I don't know what's going on. Like, and then like, you get to kind of know them. They're like, you know what? You're all right. Like, I'm okay with you. You're like, oh, great. You accepted me. Okay, cool. But, and the reality is, is that you end up creating these networks of people that just, you would never run into and never really have hung out um, other than in these car spaces. And so the content that we all end up watching is all over the place and consuming and, and liking and sharing. And so I've, I've really found that interesting. And so one of the, one of the areas I wanted to talk to y'all and ask y'all is just like, how has it been going from like, you know, well, I guess the first question should be like, how did y'all develop your online presence? And then we'll go into like, how did y'all end up in traditional media? Because I think knowing how your online presence is, came about is pretty important to like people understanding, you know, the trajectory and the time that you had to put in. And whoever wants to go. Okay, yeah, go, go ahead, Faye. Oh, shoot. Um, well, I, I was like super late to the smartphone game. I feel like in general, I, when I left the Toyota dealership, I got a job um, that required me to have a smartphone because we used a, um, a new sort of uh, repair, um, repair order software called Shopware um, developed by a cool lady out of San Francisco. And it required us to take photo and video and interact with, uh, with the customers in their cars. So um, I started really like producing content about cars for my customers so it's like it's so much easier to sell a job oh and we only had one service advisor for eight technicians in the shop um, at atomic auto in portland oregon and uh, so we were really sort of encouraged to be our own service advisors we wrote up our own um our own repair orders we sent our own recommendations to our customers and we really had to sell our own jobs for the most part it was a great learning experience so it's so much easier to to explain to someone why they need like a timing belt water pump if you're just like hey look this is cracked this is leaking you know like if i make a small like a short video and show you like wow this bushing is just like really torn or like wow this thing is really leaking like ah you know i i could create a story for the customer and that would help me do better at my job so i was like sort of financially incentivized um and from there i started actually when i left the dealership i no longer had access to the TIS, TIS, Toyota information systems. And I was working on a lot of cars that weren't just Toyotas. And I was like, oh gosh. And uh, I was trying to learn how to navigate all data and identifix. And I have no formal training. So I'm trying to learn all this stuff on the job. And so a lot of times I would end up going to YouTube just to get quick ideas. Like, hey, where's the starter motor located on this thing? Or like, you know, well, this thing has two thermostats. Where's the second one? You know, like, I don't know. On this random like 80s Isuzu Trooper or something like that, you know? So I would, I would look to YouTube. And um, eventually, I actually was my tattoo artist at the time was was speaking to me while while doing a tattoo. And he was like, "Hey, like, why don't you just like you see things all the time, and you have this insider's eye? Why don't you start sharing tips and tricks like that have helped you so much? You've got you've got to give back into the system. You can't just take, you know." And I was like, "You know, Joel, that's pretty smart." So like the first video I ever took, and I think for the first three years, I shot um, all my my videos on my Samsung Galaxy like S6 or S5 maybe like my first one I can't remember but like it was pretty bad like my first one was where's the battery location on a smart car and like within three months I got like a ridiculous amount of views and I was like wow and the comments were like this is so helpful and I was like oh my god I am helping people like not just am I helping this customer with a smart car by jumpstarting their car, getting into the shop and diagnosing this weird clunking sound. However, I am I also have the ability to touch these 50,000 people that watch this video in like three months, you know? And, uh, and I'm reading through all the comments and it's like, 
I, I've, I never really had that before. Um, that was my first introduction to the world of social media. And actually, but before then, um, I was very much into not being seen, which I think is something that like every now and then I still sort of circle back to and grapple with. But I, I did not want anyone to know that I was a woman. I didn't want anyone to, to know my name and I didn't even want my name on the repair order um, because I wanted them to just be like, oh yeah, you know, the, the mechanic said this. So I didn't discredit myself because at that point I had a bias towards women in the industry myself, um, you know, because we all sort of grow up with these uh, hot rod magazines where you open up and there's like, you know, the, the hot pit of girl in the middle. And it's like, there's a place for those for sure. But that was where my whole identity, like my whole idea of women in the industry was. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was labeled mechanic, not woman, forgetting that those two can occupy the same space at the same time. So um, it, it wasn't really until I started making the YouTube videos and then um, my boss had sort of like pushed me into like, will you please teach these like automotive classes? Like we're trying to try to do like these women's classes once a month and just like, you know, teach them some stuff, help them be better customers really by being able to check their oil, change a spare and sort of like push me into teaching these women's classes. And, um, and I got a little bit more comfortable with the idea of people knowing that I existed as their technician at that point. It was about five years into my paid career because I volunteered for free for the first three years of my career, changing oil and emptying oil change things and sweeping the floors. People, there's no overnight success that happens where I pay my dues. <laughs> <laughs> and then I changed oil for $10, a flat rate hour. And let me tell you people, if you have a Tundra with 35s, I get paid $3 for that before taxes. A full inspection, tire rotation, even if I like injure my back, changing, like rotating your 35s, I get $3 before taxes, people. So um, <laughs> then, I, then I have see people that like will get upset. It's like, I've been in a, I've been at the dealership for three months and they won't move me up. I'm like, try three years. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> rant over, rant over. But um, it wasn't until like five years into it that I'm like, okay, um, I, I'm sort of like, I lowered my... Um, I don't know, I, I had less to prove, I guess, you know, so I lowered my guard a little bit. And, um, and then I started putting myself out there and then, you know, started Instagram, which for the first like two years was only pictures of my Supra. And then slowly, slowly every now and then you'd see like, you know, my hands or like the back of my, my profile with a car behind me or something. And it, and it took me a while. I was really nervous about how it would affect my career. Um, so it was not just like, uh, let's start up social media and wow, suddenly I have a hundred thousand followers and I'm, you know, verified. It didn't, doesn't work like that. You know, both of the, my YouTube channel and my Instagram, I started in 2013. So it's been a hot minute. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And, and I do want to add in one thing because like, <laughs> you know, there are some people that are extremely good at social media and, and YouTube. And, um, and it is like a full-time job and I don't have the time to do full, you know, to have that like full-time job. So there are probably much better ways to be successful and to be successful quickly. If people went out there and actually did the research, you know, and followed what was trending and got on new trends, like really quickly. Uh, and YouTube is not my full-time job at all. It's what I try to cram into my free time. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that not everyone's going to, you know, work for for almost a, a decade to finally, you know, get verified. But, um, but you know, that's, I, I hope, hope it gives like a little bit more realistic oh, perspective no, that... of that. And there's also not very much um, crossover. I was really surprised between um, TV and YouTube. I see people comment on my YouTube all the time, like recently, like, whoa, I just saw you on TV for the first time. Like it's been four years, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, and yeah. then I thought like, as soon as I made my big debut on All Girls Garage, and like suddenly my YouTube would explode. Nah, like not at all. Like there's, the there's such different worlds. It's really interesting. Yeah, that was uh, something that, uh, and Larry, you can chime in too on this, is that I noticed that y'all's uh, social media presence are big. I mean, y'all have, relative to, some of the traditional media channels that you even work with, you may be as big or bigger. And then, I mean, obviously, you know, so y'all work with Toyota, they're going to be bigger, but, but there's some collaborations and works that y'all have done where um, like your personal branding is, is already pretty large as is. And that's why I'm like, was, you know, asking this question of how y'all got started because 
I'm seeing this like uh, duality of multiple um, audiences, you know, where people are discovering you in spaces and then coming to find out like, oh, wow, like, you know, you're, you're already like established in a lot of other places. I don't know if you want to give your perspective, Larry, of like how, where, you know, where you got started. Um, yeah, it's uh, a very, very long road, just like Faye's. Uh, over a very long period of time. It honestly started way before social media, way before, um, I, I even feel like MySpace was a thing. <laughs> it, it, it started with legitimately me going to events, going to local drift events, autocross, time attack, and I would put the photos in high res or at, in a decent resolution uh, because I knew computers, I knew web, web design, I knew gaming. Like I, it was easy for me to transition to making my own website and having photos available for people to use or to enjoy. Part of the reason why I did that is because growing up, when I first got a computer and when I first had a chance to have my own desktop backgrounds or save pictures off of the internet, it was really hard to find photos of good quality. And if you found something with good quality, it potentially could have a huge watermark on it because people didn't want them. People didn't want other people to, to uh, steal your photos, right? But I said, forget that. What my goal is to get people to share my photos and to download them and enjoy them. So it started with me getting a list of emails email addresses of people that potentially would want to see my photos. Like that is how early it was where I would get a link um, with the photos that I shot at an event and I would get whatever, 20, 25, 30, however many emails I could get. And I would send them directly. I would send the link to them directly. So they potentially have a chance to look at it and then maybe email to their friends. Like that's how early it was. And then forums started popping up. Uh, as you guys remember, before YouTube was a thing, if you wanted to find out what's wrong with your car, if you wanted to figure out a way to fix it without going to a Haynes manual, you would have to go to forums. Uh, at the time, I think VW Vortex was probably the biggest. Looks like right? a Vortex, man. That's yeah. what I was going to say. <laughs> that was the biggest. And then, you know, you had automotiveforums.com. You had... All of these things, and at the time, we, we, I th thought it was like, oh my God, this is the biggest thing. This is like a way for people that like this kind of car to meet up. And that's how you found out about meetups. And that's why that was like infant, like social media in its infancy, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So when I would go to the forums, mm -hmm. I would go to the specific forums that you know, the, like I shot the photos and I would post them on the forums that pertain to the forums. That, that's the grind. That's how early, that's how much I had to push because there wasn't social media. It wasn't really invented yet. And then, yeah. you know, slowly as Medium started popping up, Instagram, you know, Facebook, all of that, that's kind of when I started posting on those. And I guess I'm lucky in that I was already shooting and I was already paying my own way to go to these events. And I was already making contacts while this stuff was, was uh, available to me. And I just kind of got on that train and I was early on posting car stuff. And I, one of the things I always like to talk about also is that we kind of do have the unfair advantage. We're cheating in that. That's what we do is we're content creators. We take pictures and people like yourself, they spend all these hundreds or thousands of hours to build these cars. And I go up to the car and I spend two seconds to take one picture and I can share it. <laughs> and I'm almost like stealing your thunder, but not really. You know, I'm, I'm like using Sh sharing my, the thunder. Yeah, yeah, sharing yeah. The thunder. My, I'm using my voice and my mediums to promote what you're doing and to kind of show the world that this thing exists. So oh, the yeah, storyteller, there is such yeah. an important place for that. Oh my it, God. It, like it, you're doing yeah, such it, a service. It, it is just this really, really long and slow road. There wasn't one thing that changed the game. You know, it what? was just 
very, 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 very gradual. Yeah, absolutely. One the, that's why. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, that, that's why I think that there's actually, I mean, there, there's no cheating to it at all. I think there's like one theme we can sort of draw from here, which I hope people that are watching or listening to this get is that like, there, there was no five minutes to fame. There was no instant success for either of us. Anyone can get into this as late as they want to. That's all of us have that in common. We all feel like we got in late, but we all put in the work. So if you're out there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, I've, I'm in my late 20s or I'm in my early 30s or I'm in my mid 30s and I want to change my life. I want to get into this, but it's too late. I missed the boat. You did not miss the boat. You just got to put in the work and you can do it too. <laughs> yeah. And people don't have to do it in this capacity either. You know, maybe you, you and I are the insane ones that <laughs> want to put in the hours to do to get to this point. But Everybody can enjoy cars in their way and in their pace, with their pace. Uh, and it doesn't need to be your main thing either. It could just be like a side hustle or just something that you can get into just um, as a hobby, right? Um, and then it could be more my side or face side. It could be more the tinkering side, or it could be more the capturing the souls of people and the capturing the, the pictures of these cars. It, it doesn't matter. You can enjoy these cars and you can enjoy the culture your way. And one of my favorite things I like to talk about is the fact that I may, I'm never going to own all of the, all these cars that I love. I love too many cars. I think it's the same way with each one of us on this call. We all look at cars on the street or in magazines or on videos. And we're like, Oh, that thing is so cool. I would love to own that. I would love to drive that every day. But we just can't. We physically can't, you know, unless you're Jay Leno, you just can't own everything that you see. But the nice thing is we can enjoy them our way. We can take pictures of them. Um, we can take a piece of that car with us, right? We could do a video of them. We can get the Hot Wheels version of it and it's a dollar and you can have it and you can have an essence, a little piece of that car. You can have, yeah, exactly. There you go. You, you can just um, uh, harness it in that way. And that's the special part. That's what makes me feel special. And that's what keeps me going day in and day out all the time. When I'm going to these events, like this past weekend, I was at LS Fest in Las Vegas. People come up to me and they ask me, how is it that you're not tired of this? How is it that you're not burnt out? And I think to myself, like, if I feel burnt out, if I'm not happy with what I'm doing, then I would stop for sure. But the fact that I get to drive all these cool cars, photograph all these things and have all these experiences, travel the world. I've been to 50 countries on other people's time, taking pictures of cars and car culture. It is cheating. It's incredible. You know, that's something that I get asked too, Larry, about, um, about burnout. Like how have you been doing this for so long, which is not, I don't think it's so long for me. I've been in the industry 12 years. And um, I mean, since my first job, although that's, you know, I count that as 2010, my first job. Um, but, and I'm actually trying to write an article on it right now. And it is so hard trying to explain like what it is inside that, like that fire that, I mean, I don't think I could could squash if I wanted to, but I wanted to, I wanted to hit back on a point that you said earlier um, about how you don't have to do anything in this industry at the same capacity or even the same space as, as you and I, I think that's such an important point because it's like, don't, don't look at anything that anyone else is doing and thinking I can't do it. It's already been done. Like every single one of us like has something new and unique to bring to the table. And I, I'm not on all girls garage because I'm the most skilled in that position. Heck no, there's a million other mechanics out there that are freaking phenomenal. You know, that would do a good job. There's a little something unique that stood out about me in, in that audition that only, only I have. Um, and then whoever comes after me will have their own unique special thing too. Like we all, like the only thing that we have to be in this industry or any industry is like the best us. You know, and it's not freeing because you don't have to be Larry. You don't have to be me. You don't have to be, you know, Bogey or Christy Lee or, you know, Jesse Combs. Like you don't have to be any of these people. You All you have to do is be yourself, be excited about the industry, do your best, you know, never stop learning, you know, find a mentor, 
maybe several, cling on to them, look for people that inspire you. Don't get too inspired or caught up with people on social media because we all know that that's a little bit fake, right? So don't get discouraged oh, yeah. by social media, you know? Look at real people, talk to real people, at like find them in the real world. To go up to freaking Larry at car shows and ask how he doesn't get burned out. That is so cool. Like yeah. so, I, that's, so I would do that too. I would want to. That, that yeah, was, yeah. Uh, it's funny because I teach, uh, um, you know, I, I teach college. And one of the things about college that's really disheartening right now is that um, it's hard to say. It's like so many students go to college now because they have to go to college, which is weird because like I think as people that understand college and the real world, they're just throwing money like and I'm a college professor and I'm saying this because it's like this needs to be said and talked about is that they're literally throwing tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least to tuition. And they think they have to be there. And then when you tell them to do whatever they want, to try something new, to take it outside of the classroom, they've been so, uh, not because of them, but because of the systems that they've been educated in, they've been so rubricized that they're like, just tell me how to get an A. Just mm. tell me how to like get through this so I can get to the next thing. And I'm like, no, like yeah. this is that time. This is that time to revel. This is that time that you bought free time to go and do and make an experiment. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like we need to make an A so we can go get a job. And I'm like, no, no, like <laughs> this is I, I not just, what school is about. <laughs> and this is what y'all have all been sold on. Like, yeah. Anyways, I, and I, I wanted to add to what Faye said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one one thing that or a lot of people ask me what's the one tip that you can give me to improve my photography and i always say you have to just shoot what you love you can't shoot something or you can't do something that you think will just get you the likes and will get you the notoriety because there's not going to be passion behind it Mm -hmm. You just have to shoot with what you love. And I feel like it goes the same with on the mechanic side, build what you love too. You know, if you just are building something just to get the likes, I feel like that's just the wrong path. And same thing for college. If that's all you wanted and you want to experience that, that path, you want to take that path and you actually truly are, are passionate about it, then do it. But if you are only doing it because it's supposed to be the thing that you do and what everyone else wants you to do it. It's definitely the wrong path. Nailed it hundred percent. And I, I mean, I'm a huge proponent of people taking their, their own path, maybe not even going yeah. to college or maybe going to college later. I mean, there is um, something that my first mentor, Jesse from Banchworks in Providence, Rhode Island, um, taught me when I, um, when I decided that I was going to take some automotive classes at a local community college while I was working at the Toyota dealership, which by the way, I found my first mentor on Volkswagen Vortex back in 2010, so, or 2009, actually, I think, so wow. Volkswagen Vortex, um, <laughs> but uh, he always told me, he's like, exactly what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. Like you, you, you can go in and you can just do the best, do your best to get the grade, or you can go all into it and I'm actually like really glad that the courses that I, I did take I took like two I think two classes um out like after I'd already graduated and had my degree after I was already like in the automotive industry just to supplement my education with stuff that I felt like I couldn't have learned on the job and I felt like that gave me a major advantage um in the, I took a class on automatic and manual transmissions because in the dealership you don't really take them apart and you don't really diagnose them deeply it's sort of just R and R them you know, it's like, hey, this yeah. thing's bad. Put a remand warranty unit in there, and that's pretty much it. So I'm like, I'm never gonna learn the interior, like the internals of this thing. And also electrical. It's like, you know, you can't see it, so it's kind of helpful to learn what all the little symbols mean in, in the classroom with the books, you know. But but I'd already had that love of the industry. I already was driven to learn exactly what I was there to learn. Um, and I feel like that just definitely set me apart from the other students that were, first of all, like 10 years younger than me, <laughs> fresh out of high school, just being like, well, you know, I'm yeah. The only thing I really like is cars. And my dad's like forcing me to be here. And I'm like, oh, that sucks. So, so the, an the anthropologist in me has to ask, was that at St. Phillips or where was that at? Like, no, 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 that was in Portland. It was uh, oh, in PCC, Portland? Portland Community College. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, and and there's uh, there's actually a, a women's organization there. Uh, and I can't remember their name, but I I applied for a scholarship, and uh, I was the only one that applied, so I got it. Wow. <laughs> I think there's a lot. There, you know, it's, it's much more common now. A lot more female mechanics uh, now, but but back then I was the only woman that applied for the automotive scholarship, so I got all of it, and then I you know took those classes, so it was great. So that's how I could afford it on ten dollars a flat rate hour. Um, yeah. I, I didn't. I had help. <laughs> I'm still paying off my my university student yeah. loans at the time too. So man. Uh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, y'all brought up forums, and it, like that really took me back because like that was when I was doing my dissertation. I did it from 2007 to 2010 when forums were like the biggest thing, like super forums and yeah, uh, Texas 2K. You know, and there was a bunch of them, and that was like where like you talked about, Larry. That's where I post my photos up. Like I'd go to shows and I'd take photos and I'd share them if I went to like here in, in uh, central Texas, I'd go to Harris Hill road, which is like a small little track here. <laughs> and I'd share, uh, you know, photos from that. And then you would meet people and then they'd want maybe some photo shoots or some prints or something like that. And I was going to school at the same time. Like, you know, I was, and I was teaching and doing a bunch of other things like my MO, like every, like we're talking about everybody's MO, like my MO is just to help others. Like I just like to facilitate so I tend to do a lot of things and some of them okay and some of them well, but like I tend to see if other people can do it and then, you know, see how far they want to take it like y'all are talking about. And like I had a student that at my last university was like, I want to be an automotive like photographer and I want to build cars. I want to do this. And like, how many people do you hear say that like all the time? And you're like, yeah, okay, cool. Like how much fire you got? this guy got the fire. Like I met in 2019, I met with him at SEMA. He was shooting for VP racing and now he works for expel and like, he's still doing it. And, and, but you rarely like y'all are talking about, like kind of go back to the forum stuff was that putting in that time of taking photos over and over again. And then like on your side, Faye, watching people blow engines over and over and transmissions and rear discs, trying to build really fast, like 500 horsepower to thousand horsepower cars at the time were like the big, the big deal, two Jay-Z's and that kind of stuff. And, um, and people just having to just put all this money, sweat and time, depending on like where you sat. I had one person I followed had a three, an 86, 300 Z with a two Jay-Z and he's a fabricator. So he like got a Lexus, uh, uh, SC 300 motor in a, put I think a, a, a different um, gasket right like head gasket and uh, turboed it and then built a compound turbo kit for it so I had two turbos one that was smaller that fed the larger turbo it had uh, this tuner with an AEM setup uh, like a like a world-renowned tuner his name at the time was Justin Ninny you'll probably haven't heard of him uh, that tuned it for him made like 750 wheel lightened it to like 2400 pounds and we'd go to this, like San Antonio Raceway and he would street meet with everybody. Like, you know, we'd go up on the decks and do our stuff. But at the same time, the other person there was, you know, so at, at this shop had one of the fastest Supras period, you know, it was Boost Logic was who I was working with. Oh. And, you know, they had, SW had like his black Supra that was running like 246 in the Texas mile and stuff at the time. And so you'd have this strata of like big money and you would go down to this other side of ingenuity, right? Like on the mechanic side. And then Larry, like you're talking about, I would go and steal, you know, the ingenuity photos and, and the big photos and then juxtapose them together. And I think that's where like the car culture, like you're talking about Larry of capturing it really has this new level in the, in the social media scene where it's not just about a Bugatti anymore or Veyron. It's like, I think uh, one of the early people that also worked through this was Petrolicious. I don't know if you remember them from back in yes, the day. Yes, of course. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was like one of the early ones that was like trying to capture something that was just a little bit different. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm really enjoying what y'all have to say about, <laughs> about it's, this it's crazy. It's crazy with the forums. I remember it was a big deal. There was like certain meets or certain gatherings or events that were a big deal, you know, and it wasn't the traditional, you know, you have your Grand National Roaster Show or you have your Texas 2K. Um, I'm talking about the small things, the pop-up meets or the parking the lot meets or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 The that, secret meet. Yeah, it was that always was, the secret meet. It know? was just such a big deal uh, 
for one to happen. And it's like, oh, um, I can't wait for the next one. Versus now, it is crazy. There's like 10 every weekend. You can't go to every one of them because of social media and just so many more people are into cars. It's it's insane. There's there's not enough weekends or not enough time in my lifetime to go to all of these events that are available, small and big. But, oh my gosh, that's so true about like the secret meets too. I really, I really relate to that. Um, and I also wanted to just like quickly jump back to Joey's point, which, um, you know, just about getting into it with, you know, the, the big builds and like the ingenuity, but like, let's also not forget though, that like not every build is a massive, massive success right out the gate. Like I'm, I'm a little bit careful about the way that I tell my getting into the industry story. Cause I talk about, you know, a lot, I used to share, you know, like the first thing I ever did was rebuild the engine on my Volkswagen rabbit. And people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I couldn't do that. So I'm not going to get into this. You know, I'm like, well, no, no, it's, it's actually like my first job was like changing oil, like a lot of changing oil. Okay. People and stocking shelves, like not, not, not pretty, but the part that I, you know, that I used to leave out, which now I think is really important is that yes, I rebuilt that engine with major help and major oversight um, from Jesse of Banchworks. Um, but I didn't just rebuild it once. No, it was a massive failure. I rebuilt it three times before I got it right. So like, there's so much that um, like learning on the job and there's like so much trial and, and error that goes into it. It's like very easy to get discouraged. It's really easy to think, I think, especially for women in the industry, but maybe, you know, maybe everyone, I can only speak from my own perspective. But I think it's so easy for people to get a little bit disheartened um, with the barrier to entry if you don't grow up around the stuff too. So just because like, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to get in or it's hard to start. It doesn't mean that you don't belong. It means that like, we've all, we've all been through that too. At least I think a lot of us have been, been like through a bunch of like failures, a bunch of error. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's the way that we've learned as opposed to like, you know, traditional, traditional education where you're going like a, to a two or four year community college to get an automotive degree. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. So, um, yeah, cause like one of the other things about, um, car culture was that like, like y'all talked about your family's dynamic with cars. Like my parents did not believe in modifying cars. They were like, you use the car to get to work and like anything else is like, you're asking for trouble. Why are you doing that? What's going on? So I wasn't like, it wasn't until I was like 25 or 26 years old that like I put an exhaust on like our grand marquee and my family was just like, how dare you do that <laughs> what do you think you're doing with your life you know <laughs> i didn't know uh, uh jenna lee if you had uh, any experience like with how your aspirations to to get into cars like you know do you have any pushback or do you have encouragement or um i remember asking my mom and just being like i'm gonna go to the drag strip 30 minutes away and i'm just gonna go hang out just you know because it was just my friends you know and i hang out she's like that isn't it is it dirty there are you are you gonna be safe and I was like no it's 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 okay like it's just the, it's okay and if she I don't know I think there's even though it is you know such a popular thing I think there's still maybe a negative connotation around it I think even today there's still um, maybe a stigma around it and um, I did I did feel that from my mom definitely just why would you want to do that why what's pushing you to do this my daughter's changing like um, and so I definitely did feel that I think as I started bringing it up and um, I remember asking one time if I could um, get some kind of project car I was like it'll be cheap like I'll have to fix everything on it anyway so it'll be really cheap and she was like why and <laughs> It was just, it, it was interesting, I think, coming from my mother when, um, when coming to her with all of my new interests I had found. I think that's an Asian thing. I think so, <laughs> but she was very worried. I don't know if it was because I am like the oldest Asian daughter and I was growing up. Uh, it's, so. it's funny because um, even up until recently, my mom still asks me, oh, where are you going on vacation this time? And I have to explain to her, no, mom, I am going to work. I'm going to take pictures of an event or racing or this or that. It's so funny that she just let like it just slips out sometimes. Oh, are you going on vacation again? Oh, so good. 
I, I have to say like one of my proudest moments uh, as a car car nerd was uh, when I had I had a 500 horsepower Grand Marquis like I was telling you all about and I was a professor at that point my parents knew like I got a job like after 10 years of school futzing around you know cars computer stuff um, and so my dad was like hey uh, can I take your car to work to show some friends and I was all like yes <sighs> Yes, that is like the coolest thing my dad ever asked me. I like, I was like, yes, take it. You know, it's like that was like one of those kind of moments, like you're talking about, Larry, where sometimes you're like, I never thought this was gonna ever come. And I don't know if you've ever had that one of those moments with your family, but like for me, I just didn't expect it. It totally caught me off guard. That's awesome. But um, but yeah, no, like uh, it was funny because. I was telling Jenna Lee, I was like, you know, I wonder if how much we'll be able to talk about like, you know, um, race and gender and all the kinds of things that um, go on in, in the automotive space. And I didn't know how open y'all would be to it, but y'all are like totally open to talking about it. And, um, you know, it's something I wrote about in my dissertation was like race and racing. Ha ha ha. You know, Mr. Pun over here. And I also talked about, um, you know, gender and racing and because I followed like females in, in the, in the local space. And then my professor that I studied under, she's transgendered. She's one of the founders of transgender studies. Her name's Sandy Stone. And like, you know, her, her idea of me doing a good job at my dissertation, which I failed her at was getting arrested. She wanted me to get arrested like street racing or something. And she would have thought that was like totally cool. Uh, I ended up only getting like a, a really big ticket. Uh, but that was when I stopped like doing my research was that like, I was, Great. I had, a, I had bought an S2000 to justify, <laughs> I justified buying an S2000 as my research. And, um, and I, I ended up racing an IS300 and got pulled over. Uh, the guy clocked me at like 92. I'd hit like 105. And um, he was like, do you know how fast you're going? And I was like, I was, I was going really fast. And, and um, he had actually, I had actually gone and met him. Like I had been in the scene so much that I knew that I could just go home and like park my car in the garage and just lay low and I wouldn't get the ticket. But I was like, no, like I'm an Eagle scout. I'm a straight edge. I don't smoke or drink or anything. I was like, Oh, I'm going to go meet this guy. And I met him and he had already pulled the other guy over and he was like, I could impound your car. I could take you to jail. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And, um, you know, he gave me a ticket for 85 miles an hour, but I like called my, my professor. And I was like, all right, I'm done. Like, this is enough research. Like I, the next thing he's going to jail and I'm not going to do that because <laughs> I did see, I did, you know, when I was doing the street racing, I saw a couple of people go to jail and have some pretty good funny stories about paying $10,000 to get it down to a speeding ticket. But it was never, you know, that part of the scene has been so interesting depending on the different types of people that and different spaces that you study in. Uh, are in y'all's field working like when you go to the racetrack I mean people don't do that they don't do street racing I mean they're they're taking their Miata to the track and they're riding you know they're driving the car on the track and then they're bringing it home and then when you go to the street meets I mean you've, you've got all kinds of characters and the drifting scene right like you know, <laughs> it sounds like you started uh, like literally in the drifting scene that was starting out in 99 2000 era Larry like when was that like was that around that time or early um, 2000s or so when I got into the industry, I got in it a little late for the drag racing scene. Mm -hmm. um, as the drag racing scene, um, the illegal drag racing and also the um, sanctioned drag racing, import drag racing, as it was dying down, drifting was ramping up. I don't know why. It, maybe it was just a, a time for a change or whatever. Maybe it's more spectator friendly. Who knows? But a lot of the teams that used to do drag racing moved on to drifting, right? You have names like Papadakis Racing, yeah. Bergenholz. Um, some people just stayed or some people did different things. But um, uh, a lot of people, Gardella Racing, so many people from the drag racing scene moved on to drifting. And I guess I just kind of hopped on that train and I just never got off. I just kept going with the drifting scene. And, you know, because it's so mainstream now and because drifting is such a big part of car culture, um, it's just get, opened so many doors for me to do all this stuff. 
So, so um, another question I had for you all was, and I had already mentioned it was like, so how did y'all go from like, you know, new media, social media into traditional media? Cause I noticed, you know, both of y'all have ventured into that in different spaces. I know um, working with Toyota is definitely one of them in the capacities that y'all work in them. And then of course, Faye, you're on Motor Trend, you know, television and various shows. So I was just wondering like, you know, what, what was that like and how, you know, how does that come about? Um, I'll, I'll just start with this. So it, it, I did a lot of things backwards. I did the um, social web uh, blog thing first, and then I started doing magazine covers and I'm, I guess I, I would say I'm happy that I was able to get on magazine covers starting around 2011, 2012, when they were the biggest they were, uh, till all the way now when pretty much every big magazine is no longer a thing. So, I mean, I've had 10 Hot Rod magazine covers. I've had five Super Street covers. I've had, I have a pretty extensive library of magazine covers that I've had all over the world. And it's just, I don't know, it's, there's just nothing like seeing your work in a Walmart or in a, in some store, in an airport or where, where, when you're just rolling by, it's just so crazy to see one of my photos on there. Um, but I'm sad that it's gone. I'm just glad I got to at least experience that. It's uh yeah, it's just kind of a sign of the times, I guess. That kind of made me sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so wait, you said traditional, right? Yeah, on yeah, the no, no. Side, I mean, that's the yeah. most traditional Larry, thing. Larry, I mean, like, kept it real there, man. Yeah, yeah. Just no, like, it's, it's true. I mean, it's, well, because it's true, because D-Sport, you know, yeah. Super Street, like, you know, Hot Rod, like you're talking about, even Low Rider, like, all of these these magazines have had a really hard time. I mean, we talk about motor trend television, right? <laughs> like, it's like, there's some transitionary spaces here for sure. What, so Faye, like what, you know, what's your transition been like going into the broadcast space with the motor trend? Oh gosh. I mean, first of all, it's a question I get asked all the time. Like how, how do I do that? Like I want to be on TV too. How do I do it? And I'm like, I, I have no idea. This is not something I'm like, I'm going to be a mechanic because I want to be on TV. Like, right, I, right, I, right. I never, I'm still not real into television. Like, I don't even watch TV. Like, I saw my first commercial at, like, I think 13, 14 in school, mind you. So, like, I'm just, I'm way removed. Like, y'all were referencing some TV people earlier, I think. I'm like, I don't know any of those people. Um, it was never a goal. Um, the way that it came to be and that I was asked to audition um, when um, Rachel DeBarros left All Girls Garage was I had volunteered my time a year prior to work on um, bogeys from All Girls Garage, um, all female build to SEMA. And that was just something that I took my own vacation time, my own dollars, paid for my own flights. <laughs> Actually, Bogey used some of her points uh, to fly me out after I was out there a couple of times. So she was like, you're very helpful. And I was like, fantastic. Uh, and, I, and I was way intimidated to actually be a part of that project. So once again, I was like looking at it on social media. I was like, oh my God, all these girls are amazing. I don't belong there, but I really want to try. And some people have, had reached out to me and encouraged me. It's like, we need, we need warm bodies. We need hands. We need people that are capable to work on this build. I'm like, okay. You know, so I tried it out. And I ended up being like a way more integral part of the build than I thought. It was like, it was interesting. I'd never worked with other women before. Um, I'd never been in a space where like, I just walked in and there was like no big introduction. Like I just walked into the shop and no one like, no one treated, no one asked me like, you know, 50 questions of like what I can, can and cannot do. No one asked for my resume. They were like, well, what, what do you do? What's your specialty? I was like, at the time I was assembling engines and um, maintaining them for a job. So I was like, ah, I do engine stuff. And they were like, okay. Um, and then next thing I knew I was building a rear end, doing a full like custom brake um, swap on this chassis. Um, what was next? Oh, degree the cams. 
on um, that that terrible V8 BMW, first BMW I'd ever worked on before because I came from Toyota World. And of course, now I work on BMWs because of Toyota World, because Supra, but that's fine. Um, and uh, and I never expected that I would play like a major role in that, but I ended up being like one of the one of the key players and went to SEMA with Bogey and stuff like that. Um, so she had recommended me along with two other women that had also worked on the build to try out, um, to audition. And so there was, you know, there were several women that were there auditioning and, um, I wasn't really sure if I wanted the, the position to begin with. Um, but I was like, you know what? I know, like I, I called my mom and talked to my mom about it, you know, woman of all wisdom. And I was like, mom, what should I do? And she's like, well, I think you'll regret it if you don't at least try. So just try and, you know, give it, give it your best effort. And then, you know, you can always say no later on. I was like, all right. Okay. So I went and I, I tried out. Um, I was one of four people that like, I guess made it to like the, the final audition, which we did in the shop. And um, they did not prepare us at all for what we were going to do. And we all had to like watch each other's auditions. And at this point I had done all my YouTube videos filming in my own, you know, tiny little shop with my cell phone. I was not used to having a bunch of people watching me, all these cameras, all these lights. It was so intimidating. I felt like I was going to vomit the entire time. And, um, and there was all these items that were sort of like leftover from last season that people were just like sort of finishing up and getting ready to get back on the road. And they're like, well, what, which one of these things do you want to work on? And I looked around the shop and there was no Toyotas and I'm like, <sighs> okay, um, shoot, I don't know. And uh, like, well, what's your specialty? I was like, ah, I guess I like engines. They're like, okay, there's an LS over there. Why don't you teach us how to, you know, just do something quick, like set it to TDC or something. I was like, oh, that's easy. Toyota. I had never seen a camshaft that wasn't, you know, in the heads, like on top of the engine before. So I'm like, I'm all confused. Plus it was, you know, it was chain driven and Toyotas are chain driven, but you know, a lot of the times after, after I left the dealership, I'm working on older ones that are all belt driven. So I'm, I'm looking at this thing and first of all, so it was an LS and it had an aftermarket gear set on it. So there was actually no timing marks on it at all. So I'm like, all right, well, not only am I going to have to figure out like how to time this thing. So I got, a, I got on YouTube. Then I had to figure out, okay, like, how am I going to like make some fake timing marks on this thing so I can actually like show something in this video for this audition. Um, so I, you know, looked up some videos, like, okay, I think, I think I can do this. Thankfully someone else was going first, someone who specialized in welding and she was doing a fantastic job. And I was like, oh, great. You got to follow this act. <laughs> I go to turn the engine over and it is seized. It won't turn. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I was like, okay, well, I, I did something wrong. So I'm up next. She's finishing up and I'm like, crap. So I pull the heads off these things and, and realize that they're all like, there's so much car. I've never seen this before. There was so much carbon built up in the cylinders that like they were, they, it must've been carbon knocking. And that's why it was pulled. Like it, it wouldn't turn, it was seized from all the carbon in there. So I had to scrape all the carbon off, put the cylinder heads back on, torque them down to specification, which of course I had no manual. So I'm like, what specification? I don't even know. Like I'm freaking out. And I'm like, oh, you're up. And I'm like, okay. Um, and I did my best uh, on something I'd never done before. And immediately, like after I was done, burst into tears and called, called my mom and was like, I bombed it, mom. And she's like, yeah, that's right. You didn't really want it anyway. And I was like, yeah, that's you. I didn't really want it anyway. You know? And uh, I was, to my surprise, um, I, was, I was the top pick from everybody. I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is a, like, I'd never had such like a major self-esteem boost in my life. I was like, yeah, I thought I bombed it. But then of course there was this, this decision of like, well, do I want this? You know, because my life was so simple back then. And sometimes I miss it. Um, you know, no one knew who I was. I had nothing to prove. I could show up to, yeah, I could, I could walk to my 7-Eleven here um, in my pajamas and, you know, no makeup and no one would be weirded out if I just went and got coffee. You know, now it's like, well, I better put on makeup when I leave the house or else I'm going to tap, take a selfie with somebody and I better be ready because I don't want that showing up on the internet. You know, it's like, um, and, and then of course, like there's all this new set of, of expectation. And I also lost some friends um, that I wasn't expecting. You know, it's like, I, it's, it's you know, uh, I had a, I had two very close, very, very close um, girlfriends, like uh leave my life uh as soon as I was on TV and then a little bit later I had a couple who were like a little bit more honest say you know what I, I can't I can't be around you anymore um because it reminds me of what I could have done if I had just been like if I just like worked hard or something I was like no I'm a victim of circumstance like I like this this is not like 
all girls garage or like TV and motor trend is not, is not my, my end goal. You know, when I started this, my, my end goal was to help little me that wanted to do automotive tech school in high school. You know, that wanted, that wanted to do automotive class. You know, I, I want some father to watch All Girls Garage, to look through my social media, see that I am happy in my career, that I'm a respectable woman, that I'm paying all my bills, that, you know, I'm someone that my parents are proud of so that they can say when their little daughter or, or son or whomever that gets straight A's, you know, he says, he or she says, I want to work in the trades. They're like, heck yeah, that's a great career path. I encourage that. You know, in All Girls Garage, it's a great way to make that happen because then people, more people know who I am. There's a cost associated with that, though. You know, people make tons of assumptions. You know, people, <laughs> I mean, if, if you saw my tiny, pathetic little house in this teeny little shop, you wouldn't believe that I was on two TV shows. It's like, you know, th things are much, much different than people expect. So mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of burden that comes along with it that some aspects I wouldn't wish on anybody. And then in other aspects, I, I want to give every bit of my world you know, to, to that next person that's going to come after me. And, you know, so it's, it's a, but, but I'm going to, I guess the takeaway here is that like, you just have to kind of what actually exactly what Larry said earlier is that you have to follow what you want to do. Don't do anything because you think it's going to make you famous or get you this or get you that. Um, it, if you actually like have a true mission, something that is like, that sets your soul on fire. That's like bigger than yourself. You know, like Larry is showcasing the amazing things that people do, the amazing builds people have, you know, him using his platform, like that's an incredible mission, you know, like that, that's sort of how I, I'm, I made it here, but it was not, not the end goal. You know, I've, I've bigger places yet to be than this, than this crazy thing that's TV. And no, I don't watch the episodes. I don't watch the show people. <laughs> I don't even watch YouTube anymore. <laughs> no free time, no free time. But. So, um, like reflecting back on y'all's careers, both you know, little you or or in college you, not in college you. What um, were you kind of least expecting about where you are now? Thinking about you know what your career looks like, what your day to day looks like, kind of what is surprising you about where you are? You know, Mary, you want to go first? Yeah, no, you, <laughs> you got to think on that one. Oh, shoot. I mean, I I'll go if you want me to go. <laughs> I got to think about that one. So that's all you. I I don't even know where to begin with that. Honestly, I, when I was growing up, I was super, super introverted. And it was hard for me to, I guess, just navigate the world. Um, I, I grew up in Southern California. Uh, the, and the place where I grew up was very diverse uh, and you know, there was just so few Asians in the schools that I was in, especially like my high school, there was an Asian club and it was just all the Asians gathered in one club. And it, you know, it, it didn't matter what country you're from, but it's like, because there's so few of us, we all had to kind of like band together. But yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really tough to say. I, I never expected this ever. I never expected to get to this point. I just know that I had a, a passion for cars and I had a love for cars and I just set my goals very realistically every single year. And um, uh, one of the things that I've talked about before on other podcasts, I just say, or there was one point where I was like, okay, my goal is to go to these events somehow, make it somehow, you know, whether it be see my show, sleep on the floors, pitch a ride, uh, you know, help help the um, some race teams trailer their cars. I'm actually driving the the rigs to tow the vehicles there. You know, somehow or another, even if I couldn't afford the um, travel, I, I just figure out a way to get there. But with that said, uh, the other goal was okay. Hey, maybe it would be awesome at one point to somehow break even with all these events that I'm going to. Then the next year, it's like, okay, well, maybe the goal is to make a profit, even if it's just a little bit of profit. So yeah, there was never like a, oh my God, this is my dream. I want to do this. I, I want to get to this point. It was just all very realistic goals. And uh, yeah, I don't know what I would think. I, I would just think that if I was looking at what I'm doing now as a kid, I would just think that there's no way anything like this in the world exists. 
you know, if you're, if you're not a doctor, a lawyer, whatever, professor, I mean, especially coming from an Asian household, it's like, there's only those few jobs, scientists, rocket scientists, mathematician, I don't know, you know, <laughs> there's just only certain things that you fit in, but um, being someone like a creator or uh, somebody who's, who's out there creating video, photo, and, and being around things that I love. Yeah, I just, I never would have thought ever, really. That's crazy to hear. I mean, like, um, I have always looked up to you and I, you know, never, I never expected to be sitting on this podcast and I'm like sitting here like, God, like what's next? Like, gosh, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I'm glad to hear you two both just be so surprised just how far you guys have come. It's, it's crazy. It really is. And I'm glad that you know, kids now can see you guys on TV or YouTube or Instagram and they can grow up with that, knowing that, you know, you can be a woman mechanic, you can be, you know, anyone you want to be really. And it's, it's so, amazing. And, yeah. And I wanted to add to that because um, one, pe- one thing that a lot of people, a lot of my followers don't realize, and I'm guessing a lot of Faye's followers don't realize, is how, uh, how many we're like lacking this skill. There's just so many positions open. There's, we need help all the time. It's, it's, it's oh, so yeah. hard right now to find good help. If people want to do this job, if people want to be alongside of us in some capacity, whether it be a mechanic or whatever, it's crazy how, um, it's there's just a demand for it it's it's insane i could not find another photographer or videographer for the life of me to help us we're we're a smaller group you know my production company is six of us and we pack a pretty big punch for our size but oh my god we need help we need help so bad but there's just not enough passionate people, I guess, in the industry. Uh, I, I wish there was just more people that would get into it, you know, so they can help us. And I'm <gasps> guessing it's probably yeah. the same yeah. way. With oh parents. my God. Yes. Like you nailed it. <laughs> I like, I do everything myself. I'm a one woman show. I would kill for a good video editor, for a good <laughs> photographer, for a good mechanic to help me out, for a good machinist to help me out, for even someone to sweep my floors and empty my oil change things. Um, I would love to spend a little bit more time with my chickens and with, with my wonderful husband, um, but I, I can't because I can't find anyone that um, that is in it at the same level that I, I am. And it's, that's not I'm saying skill level, that's it's desire. The, that's yeah, the it's the desire, yeah, for sure. And because unfortunately, there are a lot of people that are willing to try it, but maybe it's not their cup of tea. But for those people that maybe are a little discouraged because they think it's too saturated, it is so not saturated at all. It's insane. There's, I can't tell you how many jobs I have to turn down every single day because I can't get to all of them. I'm only one I'm person saying. and you know, my, myself and the guys, uh, the, that work with me, they're so good at what they do. And they're so passionate. And I'm only here because of their help, because I essentially have five other clones now, you know, that are kind of like all, we're all working together to, for this one goal. Um, but I'll yeah, get there. I'll get there. <laughs> there really is not enough people. Um, I, I don't know why. And, well, because I, know. It I like mean, it's a fun thing to do. Well, a, a part of it is that it's blown up. Like you said, it's the biggest it's ever been. And so before there were like, cause like when I did, was doing this in 08 to 2010, there wasn't like that. Right. Like it was hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and now like, I mean, you all are saying yourselves, like there's 10 events in your local space going on for people to go take photos, go take video, make content. I mean, I tell my students, like I, I am super spread thin. Like my time is crazy because i also own a hi-fi store and i run in san antonio on the weekends and i drive three hours back and forth every week to run that business and teach but i love car stuff and i had i realized the other day i was like i haven't shot anything in two years so like i i like messaged my friend that got a ferrari f12 and he's been like three cars deep 
in terms he's a uh, what i call a serial collector so he just goes one after the other he had he had had like a 911 rs2 i didn't shoot he had a ferrari uh 488 gto i didn't shoot i looked back and i was like last time i shot him was like 2017 or something like that so i i hit him up and i was like hey can i meet you in front of academy sports and outdoors a sporting goods place like in san antonio i'm like go do some rolling shots go shoot your car get an interview with you talk to you about it and and he was like sure and you know it, it really like like what's so cool about this space is that you can make something out of nothing you can go and you can go to a cars and coffee. You can go and talk to someone and you can ask them to go do a car shoot. You can do a car shoot right there. If you're trying to practice for the first time and get experience, like, you know, if you're a car person and you're trying to get people to like do stuff on your cars, go to a car meet, look for the photographer, you know, talk them up, see if there's any interest there, you know, um, follow people on their social media that, that are doing things that are interesting to you. Tell them about your project. Cause one thing I'll go way back on Larry that you said that I know you meant it in jest, but like, uh, uh, you said, you know, uh, Faye and every, all these mechanics are making these things and I just take their thunder and, and shoot the photo, but there is an art to it. There is an art to photography and automotive photography, because I don't know how many build shoots I've seen. <laughs> like You're like, come on guys. Like you're shooting this thing with a potato. Like you could literally, I mean, with my iPhone, I could get better photos of this build and just make it pop and make it and not pop as in like exotic, but pop in, in terms of giving it the authenticity that it deserves. Right. So sometimes that's even grittiness to it, but that's an art. And that's what you do. Like your autofocus channel that now is Larry Chin, you know, you have an aesthetic to it, a sincerity to it. You have your enthusiast side to it. When you're like going and asking about the cars, like I can hear it in your voice. Like you're excited, mm -hmm. you know, you're there and you're like, yeah, so we can take this out. And they're like, yeah. And you're like, okay, like, let's go do it. You know, and oh. Even like, you can hear the child, inner child in you going like, I'm doing this today. You know, like, this is cool. Yeah. And that, that is a, a really good point. And just touching on that aspect, part of the reason why I'm excited is because there's so much to learn. There's just so much. I mean, I've just scratched the surface of car culture. I feel like I've been able to take in a lot of it, uh, but there's just so many things that, that I've never seen before. Uh, every single time I go out to shoot, I would get surprised by something you know, because it's some ingenuity or some way of building something or some way of painting it or some different motor swap that I've never seen or some way to make it work. There's always something because it, you know, the world's your oyster. You, know, you could build whatever you want. You could do whatever you want. Um, there's what, when I got into shooting heavily, a lot of times I just didn't understand. I didn't know what was cool. I didn't know what was right. I didn't know even maybe what makes this car look good or what parts of it show off. Um, how good it is I had to learn all of that and over time I've been able to just from my experiences just get better and modify my craft to get to that point so it's um, now is honestly the best time for that because of how much information is out there and on top of that you know like you said you could just hit up somebody and ask them hey can I shoot your car you, you go to a car show, there's just so many people doing that, creating their own content and doing it for themselves. That's what makes them happy. Jenna, did you have a last question over here? I do. All right. So at the core, we're all the same. We're all little little boys and girls freaking out about cars. Tell me about your current projects or your little, your current freakouts right now. What are y'all obsessed with? What do we got? I, I'll start this one because yeah, it's like ahead. so freaking easy and obvious for me. And um, 
<laughs> sort of like harpens back to like the whole point of like don't get discouraged things go wrong sort of thing um i, I i've been building my mark three supra for um a very long time since like 2015 and i run into um a bunch of issues with it and it, it's um it's become like the best learning tool i've i've ever had in, in my entire life um and i'm, I'm getting to a, a point where the the engine is uh is, is almost done but i'm sort of going extremely um uh, obsessive about it um, attention to detail wise and it's like probably the greatest the greatest thing in my I love this thing so much I've attached it on my arm okay people so this is this is definitely an obsession and the engine's over here too so it's a little <laughs> bit of an obsession uh, Larry mentioned earlier that he was like we can't possibly own our dream cars or like all the cars we ever want I'm like I, but I do though I, I, you know, and, and Good for you. question of like, with, with, what, that, with what, that said, I need to shoot that car now. <laughs> you do. I, yeah, I need to. <laughs> yeah. um, That's so a Larry I, Chen video right there. Yeah, that on. is a video. That is a good video. <laughs> uh, it is the love of my life. And I actually tattooed um, by myself, mind you, I bought my own tattoo gun, uh, machine, not gun, sorry, machine can't get the tattoos upset. Um, and I tattooed my fin numbers on my wrist, like, because like these two cars, like really, changed my life and like leveled me up um in as a as a professional and um and you know a little bit to uh to quote um like one of the few movies i've ever seen love the beast when i crashed my super for the first time i watched love the beast i remember dr phil saying to the the race car driver like you know i can tell you from personal experience that fixing that car is like damn good therapy so like bringing back my therapist and then also my my mechanical uh my you know my my mechanical skill and my love of automotive it's like really like working on these cars is therapeutic to me um and has really changed who i am and like you know my personal growth so um that that car um uh, my 89 is 100 percent like the love of my life the most exciting thing going on in my life right now oh, that is, my chickens okay my chickens <laughs> that is amazing so that is the life her car for you right that's your oh, life her car never you, you i don't know if i'm allowed to be buried in it but um, <laughs> <laughs> so th that's that's pretty cool um because, um, I mean, that's as far removed as possible from a vehicle being an appliance, right? It's, it's become something greater than that. It's like become a part of you. It's like emotional. It is, it has a soul. It's really crazy. And I mean, who knows what the future will, will hold, but I know one thing for sure, if there are more appliances, that are just driving us around. As long as we get to keep these things, like as long as I get to keep that orange thing, uh, then I'm okay with it. You know, if if it means that it's maybe taking more car, more bad cars off the road, and it's like letting us kind of just enjoy our toys, then I'm okay with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, uh... You know, you bring up something that's like a whole nother podcast about EPA and and uh, where our industry is heading. My dad sent me a, a message from the drive.com, you know, link and about Cobb. And I was like, oh, man, so my dad's like, what's going on with this? I'm like, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> it's like, this has been five years in the making. Like I said, it's a whole nother podcast. But yeah, I think, Larry, you allude to the idea that the combustion engine is, you know, definitely in a space right now where it's going to start getting locked down and that, that open black box of innovation and, and things is really close to coming to a close and getting put into history and this whole other space that we're going to move into. Yeah. But, um, I, I think uh, we won't really have to worry about it, honestly, in all, all of our lifetimes. I think yeah. it'll still be, it's, it's too ingrained in our life for it to be, um, for it to really change what we're doing. Maybe in other countries, but I feel like in the US at least, and in some other countries that are more um, passionate like about automobiles. Australia maybe. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's gonna be really hard to change. I mean, without a doubt, I kind of feel like it'll be hard for the Japanese to change their ways. I mean, one of the fun things I always like to poke fun at with my Japanese friends is that they still use fax machines and they just can't get away from them. They just <laughs> love their, they love their darn fax machines. You know, I haven't had a fax machine probably for 15 years, <laughs> but, but um, they're, they're just like, they, they love what they love and they, they're so 
um, into it and they, they make it the best out of it. And I feel like that's kind of the same way we are with cars here too, you know, and, and that's why these things, these will last a long time while there are going to be the appliances coming out, which is fine. But um, in terms of projects, my most recent thing really is to push myself and push my guys to drive as much as possible on the racetrack, pushing 10 tenths, pushing hard. Um, oh, did my camera go off? Uh, it seems like, yeah, you may have a little oh, bit of a... Yeah, I think I'm probably out of power, but it's all if good. you guys we can still, still hear you. me. Oh, yeah, 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 we hear so you. My, my big thing really is uh, getting into drifting, you know, sliding cars, enjoying cars to their limit because um, there's just, I feel like there's nothing freer than that um, on in terms of like a, like a mental thing. Yeah. My camera's out of battery. It's all good. You want to give me just two seconds here? Yeah. 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 Uh, Got the I'll, EOS. I'll interject while yeah, 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 he's, um, yeah. he's getting all, cause I, you know, there's something I wanted to add to that in terms of cool projects coming up in, in my life. When you mentioned um, emissions and everything and where the world is going, um, this is not necessarily my project, but one that I'm involved in and really, really excited about. Um, is that my uh, my mentor? Um, I'm learning I'm learning machining skills as well. Automotive, the world of automotive machining, and um, my mentor That's, is that Hill uh, Country. Yes, the, performance yeah, yeah. machine. Yeah, yeah, where I work. Um, uh, my mentor Danny is currently. Um, I found one of Smokey Unix's historic um, hot vapor cars on eBay, um, and we have the or he has the car and one of the original engines. Um, and I've been so freaking lucky that he's brought me into that project to help him restore that car and see if we could figure out the science behind the hot vapor engine, which um, Danny has, has a few of them. One in particular is the three cylinder hot vapor engine, which harnesses every single, you know, at, at this, is, this is stage one. He was, Smokey was working on several stages and um, we can't find a lot of the original paperwork and he kept out a lot of his secrets, but um, it was the design is basically to harness every single ounce of, of energy that the car puts out. So we lose what 70% efficiency in heat. Well, the whole idea of the hot vapor engine was to keep all the heat inside and not let that energy go to waste. So we're going to, and, and that car um, with no catalytic converters got 45, 50 miles per gallon and passed full emissions um, with, with no catalytic converters. So, you know, there's, there's a, there's going to be some technology out there that is either, um, not capitalized on for whatever reason, hidden for whatever reason. I mean, who knows what's going on? I'm not not smart enough to know what's what's up out there. But um, but there there's some cool uh, there's some cool technology and some cool projects I'm looking forward to as well. So the Plymouth Horizon, Smoky Unix, hot vapor Plymouth Horizon. Not the most exciting car, but the history is <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Wow, that's like <laughs> thank you. I mean, yeah, we were like almost going to like coast to coast there. If you've ever heard of that show with Art Bell, yeah. but uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's like we were getting out there, but that's so cool. Yeah. I just, I commute and like went all in on my hi-fi store and teach so much that like I had to get rid of like any cars that I had. I have a GX 470 that I drive back and forth and put like 20,000 miles uh, a year on. And I just bought this like an eight months ago, I bought a, a for 1300 bucks, a, a, a 2005 GTI. And I've been slowly like having really? stuff like it's a coupe two door. I just ordered inky RPF one golds for it. Cause I thought that would be a nice cheesy wheel to put on it. But you know, we're in Texas, so we'll see what kind Very of uh, folks like in vortex of you. Just, yeah. Sorry, what kind you. of a turbo back exhaust we'll put on it. Since yeah. <laughs> Or if you I wanted mean, to go like really played no way, you should have BBS arrested, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's very true. So, um, but yeah, no, uh, you know, I want to thank you all so much for your time. Um, this has meant a lot to uh, both uh, Jenna Lee and I. I mean, obviously we're huge fans. Um, we wore matching shirts just because. Just <laughs> 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 I just Are we all wearing gray right now? Yeah, we're all. Yeah. We're oh all, my God. We're all in gray. <laughs> So it was a coordinated effort on our part. We sent out the energy through Art Bell. Got the memo. Provided, Got the memo. yeah, yeah. But um, you all brought up so much stuff that I could just, yeah. I, I mean, I did my dissertation on on this on car culture, but you all are amazing to talk to about car culture. Y'all not only understand automotive media making, but understand car culture because of it. 
at a level that's really, really fun to discuss and explore with. So thank y'all so much. Uh, unless, generally, I don't know if you have anything you want to say real quick, and then I, y'all can say what y'all want to say when we... Can. I just wanted to finish my thought on, on okay. the whole driving thing. Uh, one of the things that is so crazy about when, when you're actually doing performance driving, when you're on the track or when you're drifting, you really cannot think about anything else. If you think about something else, if you have uh, just that lapse of concentration, then you're off or there, or you're on your roof or something, you know, something bad. So I urge you guys or whoever's listening, if you've never done any performance driving on track, drifting or whatever, try it because it is very therapeutic. It is life-changing and it's incredible because that's how I'm able to shut my brain off. When I'm there and I'm full sideways and I'm looking back and I see a bunch of tire smoke and I'm just going through the gears, bouncing off the rev limiter, it is not, there's nothing else like it. It's just bliss. It's amazing. So yeah, try, try that. That's, that's, that's so true. I like, uh, I once looked in my rear view mirror while on the track once because I ended up backwards doing that, you know, because you look, you see someone and all of a sudden you're turned around because you weren't paying attention for that split second. And I was shooting video at the time and I just felt like the, the, the biggest dummy because I broke the major rule, which is never look back. <laughs> so that's, yeah, when you're in it, you're in it. And uh, that's, that's so true. Regina Lee, were you going to say something? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, this has just been an incredible opportunity. I loved talking to y'all. I personally, I don't know everything there is to know about cars. I mean, nobody does, but I really don't know everything. Um, And I just, I love the people. I love the experiences and just hearing y'all talk about your careers and where you are now. It's, it's so much deeper than knowing what kind of engine, you know, I'm looking at or what a transmission is. It's just so much more. And it's, it's really incredible. Very thankful. I hope people get inspired by this. I was going to say like, I was inspired (laughs) by this podcast. (laughs) So hopefully, uh, hopefully lifted some people up with this. um, And people got the message we were here to to give i don't know yeah well we're going to share this on youtube and so we'll give that to you all to to put out there into the ethos and then also um you know my goal is to create a uh, automotive media course at a and i've pitched it once they're like yeah i'm like no 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 like i want to send them to sema i reached out to uh dan garner i think that's his name right over at dg spec don uh, that, yep don yeah uh, uh don there we go yeah uh, uh uh, about maybe doing some collaborations with them, but like, I'd also like to circle back with you all and, you know, kind of explore, like if y'all are ever, I noticed that sometimes y'all end up at circuit of the Americas, which is really close to us and other spaces. And so maybe one day we can meet up in the flesh in the real world and, uh, and kind of, uh, you know, get to have some students, uh, see what's going on. So, um, thank y'all so much for your time again. Did y'all have anything you wanted to push or show? No, y'all are good. I mean, my chickens are too far away to grab right now. So I can't, I can't do any show until the last minute. I'm sorry. You just have to follow them on the Hadley heads. I I will say as an, (laughs) as an anthropologist, Faye, I knew that you were unbelievably busy when the chickens stopped showing up as much in your social media posts. (gasps) Yeah. Yes. Uh, Unfortunately, my chickens Instagram takes like a backseat to everything. So yeah, when I, when I quit posting on the Hadley heads, you know, I'm either traveling a bunch or I guess there's, there's no. There's no free time for even sleep. <laughs> and, and as an anthropologist, because I study like online automotive culture, right? So I study like all the YouTubers, all the Instagrammers, everybody. So La- I know Larry's really busy when he's posting up photos that are from like five different places within like a weekend. And I'm like, Whoa. you know, come on, yeah. man. Like, <laughs> oh my God. You are tired. <laughs> Or like, yeah. you know, when, when you have like your, your uh, big Canon lenses out and you're out mm-hmm. in the desert shooting, I'm like, that is yeah. exhausting. And you have your, your hat with all of your full clothing on to like not sunburn out over eight to 12 hours of shooting. And I'm just like, you know, you're, it's one thing to, um, 
do these things. It's another thing for y'all to share and document it. And uh, as an anthropologist, I see the work, the hours, the sleepless nights, like all these things that are that are being done. <laughs> I can um, barely move my lips right now because of how sunburned they are. <laughs> just, I mean, <laughs> you could probably see I I have a pretty bad sunglasses tan right now just from being in the sun for the past couple of days, especially at LS Fest. But um, yeah, it, it, being out there, it's rough, but man, it's a fun. Well, thank you all so much. I'm going to uh, play us out in terms of uh, the stream and uh, everybody can wave goodbye. We'll say y'all have a good Bye. one.